everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. I am a principal broker here at Best Real Estate Company, and this is the latest episode of Best Real Estate Company Friday Focus. And I don't have a lot um, for us today, as um, you guys uh, might have heard of me mention in a, 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 some previous episodes, a previous episode um, back that our Shanita um, was taking on a different um, kind of a role in her business. And so um, because she's taking on that role, she um, would um, probably not be able to do as many of these as, as we thought. She also has some very exciting familial news um, going on as well. So do I. And um, our news is actually the same. Uh, for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, I am going to become a grandmother. So I'm having my first grandbaby. Um, I'm going to be called Yaya. So um, if any of you are friends with me on Facebook, you saw I posted a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be a Yaya. That's going to be my name um, with, with my um, grandbaby that's coming. And I'm so, so excited. I've been waiting such a long time um, to... Uh, be able to experience this part of life and, you know, just being able to watch my own daughter grow up and become such a phenomenal person um, and to just see how she's going to navigate motherhood, of course, with my undying devotion and help. Um, it's just been a real treat for my family, not just me, but all the people in my family. And so, um, that's kind of the same thing that's happening with Shanita as well. She's becoming a grandmother as well. Um, and I think our due dates are just maybe a couple months different. I think her, her, her daughter is due in March and my daughter is due in May. Um, and so, but her daughter is all the way across the country. And so I do believe that um, she's traveling with family this week. I'm not sure if it's the daughter or not. It might be her son. But I do know that she's been out of town and, and she's been traveling. And so she has not is not here today to um, help with the podcast. But that's okay because I was able to put it together myself um, along with all the other things that I've had going on as well. And we're getting ready to wind down our year. Um, so I wanted to just take a few moments to kind of remind people we are in the month of October Usually the month of October is the month that I use to start um, trying to figure out where my business is going to be headed in the following year. Um, I think about my goals. I look at um, the goals that I set last year for this year to be, to be able to see what my progress was and looking at things where I may, may have done great, you know, and, and, and trying to figure out things where I was great, um, where I was going to be keeping certain um, things that I've implemented. Um, and then obviously things that didn't go so well um, or that I, maybe I didn't get to, um, you know, but they're just as important as they always were to me. I'm going to be adding those to my um, list of things to do in the upcoming year. And then um, I usually take time to focus on what the reasoning was. So what were the things that I could have done differently to accomplish the things that I didn't accomplish? And um, I think that's very important for anybody in business, especially if um, you're at the phase of your business where you're looking to grow and expand. You always want to be thinking um, in terms of the future um, and you know, you always want to be assessing um, the things that you have done um, and the things that you want to do so that you can um, make sure that, you know, you're taking targeted action um, towards completing those goals for the next year. So I hope that everybody is doing that. Don't wait until January. Um, to start thinking about what you're going to be doing in January because by then, in my mind, it's too late. You need to already have a plan. And the other thing is uh, planning 
also helps you to, to prioritize. So I've said it a hundred times to a lot of uh, so many of you, and I'll keep saying it. I believe in putting my uh, my faith first, my family second, and my career last. That is the order in which I live my life. That is the order in which I order my steps. Um, and so, um, and and I can't think of anything that I would uh, allow to deter me from that order. So um, I'm just saying that to say your priorities don't have to be that. I think that's the best, you know, uh, order of priorities. Um, but that's just for me and I don't judge anybody else. So whatever your priorities are, however you organize that, you still need to be planning that so that you can track it and make sure that you're realizing the, your goals. And that brings me to our book. Um, we are still reading this book. I've, I've actually finished the book, just so you guys know, but I'm going to go through here still and point out certain things that I think, you know, are important. Like I said, we're never going to be reading the entire chapter, uh, word for word verbatim on this podcast, because there's just not enough time for that. And I really want you guys to get the book and then focus on, um, what you're reading in there and, and, and marinate on it. And you know, if you guys have a different perspective from what I from what I am gathering from the book, then please let me know that. Um, I have really been um, hoping, you know, that this year that some of the things that I bring to you guys have been um, things that you know you find worthy and that help you to think about how, you know, things are going in your business and, you know, hopefully helps you to make some positive changes if you need that or, you know, helps you to keep doing something even better if you're doing something that's great. And so um, I digress. I'm, I'm moving on to chapter three. And the name of the book, just again, is How to Have Confidence and Power in Dealing with People is by Liz Giblin. Um, and like I said, the book was given to me um, by my mentor, Larry Mayall, and um, it still has a lot of things in it that ring true today. And so now we're on chapter three because I've been skipping around and not doing a, a chapter every week like uh, we probably should be. Um, but sometimes other things take precedence and, and you have to uh, put those things in in front of the things that you really want to be doing. And that's okay. We can always, you know, circle back and and add those things back that we want to that we want to add when the time permits. And so this is one such time. And we were on chapter three and um, chapter three was labeled how to cash in on your hidden assets. And if you read the chapter and even if you didn't read the chapter, um, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of what that meant. Uh, what they meant was by cashing in on your hidden assets was um, your asset for of human relations. So everyone knows another human, at least one other human, and so you and and every one of us is is um, relating to at least one human. And how we dole out that commodity that we each have. Um, our human relatability um, can either make or break a relationship. It can make or break a business. Um, it can open doors for opportunities or close doors um, for opportunities. And so this chapter was really focused on helping you to make the best of your commodity of human relations. And there was just a few things in here that um, I thought were interesting enough to say out loud to you in hopes that, you know, you can remember them. One is try giving away your wealth. Um, that speaks volumes to me for uh, several reasons. One, um, if you've ever studied the, you know, the first millionaires of our country, the first uh, people who had uh, what were their documents, uh, lots of documentation, I should say, where they, these people came and they, you know, they basically 
um, set out to live the American dream. They actually achieved it in terms of finance. Um, people who come from the Gilded Age and, 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 and before and after even. Um, some of my favorite um, historical characters from American history are like Andrew Carnegie, um, the Rockefellers, um, and these are people who just had, you know, just a few people who, you know, a few families who had tremendous wealth. Uh, the Astor family, um, which uh, the Astor family is um, not <clears throat> as prominent in terms of wealth now um, as it was when it was at, when it, when the family was, you know, having its heyday. But the Astor family is still very much a prominent and powerful family in Europe. Um, they actually hail from Germany, I believe. Uh, but they came to America and they made um, their way up, uh, what made their way here. Um, and as did the, Car the Carnegie family, uh, Andrew Carnegie and you know, all of those people came from, they were descendants from immigrants. Um, and they just came over here and, you know, they met um, opportunity with tenacity, I should say. And they have become, you know, some of the most influential figures in our history. And but one of the things that I always appreciate about specifically Andrew Carnegie and, and, and John D. Rockefeller, but, but specifically Andrew Carnegie, um, when you look at his, his life um, and how he lived, he was never, um, let me see what's the best way for me to say this. He was always a humble person. He, um, and he was a helpful person. He wanted to, he wanted to not only help his country, um, that he came from, I believe, um, he did lots of things over there. He, uh, actually, um, sent them uh, monies to like build a library and things of that nature. Um, and he also did a lot um, to uh, to advance education and the, and the like. The Vanderbilts is another um, well-known family that um, had people in it um, that, you know, gave back in terms of human capital. Sure, they shared their money but they also shared um, the wealth that was their ability to relate to other humans, uh, uh, to see the challenges that uh, mankind was having, not only in this country, but abroad. And, you know, they actually worked to um, eradicate that. If you, you know, if you look at uh, Milton Hershey, for example, um, and there's Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, the, the story behind that was, it wasn't a vain um, reason that he built Hershey, Pennsylvania. It was, uh, or that he started the town. It was actually um, started out of the care and admiration that he had for the people who would be working in the factory that he was going to build not far from there. He wanted... You know, obviously it was good for him to have transit services, so railroads and things to bring in the best products or ingredients to make his world famous chocolate. But he also wanted the people who were working for him to be able to have an easy commute. He wanted them to not have to live far away. Um, he wanted them to have safe and affordable uh, housing. Um, and he built that. Uh, for them. And so, you know, that even though these men had challenges and they, you know, they went through things, every, you can't make people, you know, 100% of the people happy 100% of the time. Overall, um, in the things that they did in, in, in terms of their documented life, you can see that uh, they were giving away um, not only just money, um, but they were giving away a wealth of relatability in terms of humanity. 
And I think that's very important. And so um, that's one of the things that the book talks about is it says, try giving away your wealth. Um, everyone is hungry for the food of humanity. Everyone wants to feel important. Everyone wants to be treated kindly. Everyone uh, appreciates politeness. Everyone appreciates the truth. Um, and, you know, I, um, in my life, have heard um, things such as from, from great people, like, and when I mean great, I mean people who have influenced a lot of people in their hearts, as well as people who have, you know, acquired a lot of financial wealth. Um, one of the things that always stuck out to me was, you know, you should, something that someone said was that you should look at everyone um, as if they have a sign around their neck that says, make me feel important. And that is what the crux of what I wanted to get to with um, this chapter is about and how we should be, you know, doing that in our real estate businesses. Um, you know, we don't want to, um, as the book say, says, underestimate small courtesies like showing up on time for your, you know, listing appointment or your showing appointment, especially now that we only have a couple of weeks before daylight savings time is over. We all recognize that who our top buying demographic is right now, which is women. And so women are going to be out here looking at properties when they get off work. So the, 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 the least that we could do is be on time so that we can ensure their safety. If we can show up a few minutes early so that you know, they don't have to sit in a parked car on the side of a street in an un, in an unfamiliar neighborhood or whatever, waiting on their agent to show up and open the door. You, you know, you should already um, be there. Listen to your clients and allow them to make their own decisions. Our primary function is really to provide our clients with the right information and a complete set of facts based on what we have been able to gather and understand ourselves. And then you allow your client the opportunity to make their own decision about how they want to move forward with the property or in a transaction. And even if they do something that you don't agree with, you must respect it. Um, and, um, try to honor their decision with, if nothing else, courtesy. Now, if you have some other information that you can share with them to help them um, to, to make a more informed decision, then by all means do that. But, you know, don't, if your client says, no, they're not sure about something, they don't like something, you know, um, they're not feeling, you know, feeling confident in a thing, you know, or they just don't want a house, don't, you know, push them towards that because you've shown them 15 other houses. Don't um, make them feel pressure that they have to buy a particular property. And I've heard lots of complaints this year. Um, and, and let me preface this by, because I talk to other brokers. So I've heard about lots of complaints this year. Some have come from um, agents in our office, but um, like I always try to remind you guys that I do feel blessed that we have agents who are not primarily operating in the, in the realm of thinking of themselves. But, you know, I have heard complaints where people are like, well, I felt like my agent was just in it for themselves, just in it to get their own commission or to pay their own bills. And, and we just can't operate that way and know that, you know, God provides um, if you are um, doing the right things and if you are have the right type of heart, um, I just believe that God will provide. Um, you also have to do good work. So, you know, you can't just sit around on your rest on your laurels, but you do have to do good work, too. And I believe that work is reciprocated. And I believe just like if you show someone a good attitude and a positive um, a positive picture of who you are, 
you know, um, and they're not impeded by any negative feelings that they may have, you know, gathered before they met you or come into contact with you, then they're probably going to receive you in a positive way. And that's what we want. Um, is to is to have those kind of interactions as much as possible. So, you know, make sure that your clients feel like you're invested in um, in 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 giving them a a human a, a, a human experience that is comfortable, that is caring, that is insightful, um, that is truthful. Um, and see, doesn't that, you know, pay back, uh, pay you back in spades in ways that, you know, you probably haven't even thought about. That's number one. Um, remind yourself that people are important and that your attitude will get across to the other person, which I just talked about. Um, you know, notice other people, pay attention to a man or child and you make him feel important. So that's something I just mentioned. And then don't lord over other people or attempt to increase your own feeling of self-importance by making them feel small. So, you know, sometimes people have a position or a title and it kind of goes to their head. Um, they may say things that are insensitive. Um, they may be m more assertive uh, than they need to be in certain situations because they have that, you know, a specific title or position. And it's not always because a person is like that in general. Sometimes, especially I've seen this with new leaders, uh, sometimes new leaders can just feel the weight of a position so much so um, that they feel like they have to approach. That should be their first approach is to come out and say, hey, I'm the one in charge and you know, it has to be my way or no way. And that's not always the case. I've always tried to lead with love and humbleness and, you know, uh, say to people, you know, what's working right? Because we don't want to upset the things that are working right. It, 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 um, and, you know, what are some things because you've been here longer than me that you think we can approve on? And then you take that information and kind of work backwards. And so that's what I'm thinking. Um I know that's what I normally do. So, you know, uh, when I'm coming into a, a place where I'm a new leader and, you know, people have history and they've been there before and that always seems to serve me well. But the, the, the points are all very um, consistent with what I said for, uh, for the end of this chapter. Don't be stingy and feeding the hunger um, for a feeling of importance. Don't underestimate um, the small things, you know. Like I said, remind people you that they are important, you know, notice other people more and, and don't, you know, lord over people. So that's that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is actually show you guys um, one of the NAR magazines that comes in the mail. Everybody's familiar with Realtor, your Realtor magazine. But this is the Create magazine that I was telling you about or that I've mentioned several times. That's all about commercial, um, the commercial world and what's happening in the commercial world. As you can see, it is produced by NAR. Um, and this is a free publication. I get it every other month, I think, or every quarter. Yeah, this is fall. So every quarter. And in here, they've got some really good um, information. They have, um, like right here on page four, um, they're giving um, agents valuable information and reliable information on how to add value in land sales. So uh, when you represent your client in a land sale, your role may be may include providing the appraiser with comprehensive information about the land's physical and legal aspects. A proper valuation benefits from detailed surveys, site plans, and information about physical characteristics such as topography, soil type, and vegetation. Um, legal details like easements and encroachments are also crucial. And so they talk to you about how to go about getting that information and give you they give you a brief overview of how to assemble that. So for those of you who are working in the, or, um, the commercial field or you're trying to 
um, get into the commercial space and you have questions about um, those kinds of things, this is a magazine that can help put you on the path to finding more information, things that you may need to, uh, to help carry you forward. Also, I want to say to you guys that there are certain things, these publications, um, the different newspaper articles and uh, newspaper um, sources, not articles, but that come to the office. Um, if they have my name on them, and I don't want you to just run out of here with it um, <laughs> because I might not have read it yet um, because I have all of my real estate mail come to the real estate office. But if I have an article or if I have a magazine or something that you know, you might want to take a look at. I'm very open to sharing these things because I do know that, that we have some agents who are not realtors who would not have access to this. So if you're a non-affiliated agent and you want to take advantage of some of this information, um, if it's on my desk or in my office, I don't mind sharing it with you. So just uh, you guys know that. Um, they're also talking about a tax credit proposed for downtown revitalization projects. I actually talked, uh, was at a meeting where our local city mayor talked about that, um, how there is this new bipartisan legislation. Um, it's called the Revitalizing Downtowns and Main Streets Act, HR 9002, um, which would provide developers and building owners with a tax credit to convert underscrutalized, underscrutalized, no, underutilized or vacant commercial properties to residential use. I'm not going to give you guys all of this article, uh, but I just highlighted that because that was uh, the, the part that stuck out to me and they give specifics on um, the percentage of a tax credit that it's going to be, how it plays out and how it's going to work out. If you want more information on it and you don't have access to the Create magazine, you can go to NIOP. So that's N-A-I-O-P dot org forward slash adaptive hyphen reuse and learn all about it and see all of the uh, all of the um uh, the information that's going on around that's going on around it. Also, I want to tell you that um, we have some tax credits that are going to be expiring next year um, that um, were put into place under um, the previous administration, not the current one. Um, one of the things that is um, really going to uh, that that that, are, that are, is a part of the, that that package that was passed. I think it was twenty seventeen. Um, was that the way that they treated um, 1031 exchanges, there are going to be some, some changes to how 1031 exchanges work. I do believe based on what I read and what I understand, and if someone has a different understanding, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you come on and pop on and, and talk about it. But from what I understand it to be is that um, you will no longer be able to use your, and I don't know of anybody that was even doing this, but I guess there was because <laughs> they, you know, are, are making it a thing now. But I don't think that you'll be able to use the 1031 exchange option for personal properties any, any longer. Uh, but they have some other things um, that are going to remain that are going to be uh, beneficial for those people who operate in, in that space. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, the other thing is um, there there's uh, a lot of buzz around turning old work, commercial buildings, workspaces into uh, mixed use properties and into, you know, apartments. Um, and so there's a lot in, in the magazine about that this time around. Um, there's also um, a, a really nice article in here about an economic development master. He was an attorney um, who has facilitated public and private partnerships um, to breathe a new life into commercial properties that were um, actually becoming run down and dilapidated because people, you know, after COVID, 
um, went home to work and they just never left home. There's a lot of them are still working there. Um, and so they're there. And, and this is also uh, could be a unique perspective um, to solving, you know, some of the crisis that we have on the residential side where we're short so many homes. And so I'm excited to see, you know, well, I was excited to read that article. Um, the um, the developer is named Eon Nichols, um, and he is uh, an immigrant from Guyana, but he has played a pivotal role in transforming the region, which is um, New York, West, Westchester County, New York, um, through innovative development strategies and a deep understanding of economic incentives. And so he puts five takeaways in here um, that uh, can help property owners and developers meet the needs of the community through the use of economic development incentives. And so if that's something you're into, it's definitely worth a read, some really good information in there. Um, they're telling us through research, because see there's a research page as well. Um, they're telling us through research that um, multifamily absorption rates are still strong. Um, there is still an oversupply in the sector, uh, but they, you know, they're saying it's temporary and it is raising vacancy rates and holding down rent growth. So um, that's a good thing for some. Uh, the ability to absorb will depend on economic strength going forward. And then they give you um, a, little, a little graph here that kind of shows you um, what the absorption rates were and the vacancy rates where we have the hot markets and things of that nature. And they also break it down by type of real estate. So you've got industrial real estate, multifamily, office and retail. Um, and this um, this uh, information was provided to NAR through, by CoStar. So I don't know if you guys know um, who CoStar is, but CoStar, uh, LoopNet, all of that's the same thing, uh, the same company. Um, um, Lawrence Young, who is um, the chief economist and senior vice president of research for NAR, has another little short uh, story in here. It's called The Waiting Game. And he's saying that the interest rate cuts should lead to more sales and higher values in the long run. So I'm assuming that NAR is uh, accepting of and um, um, supporting the recent uh, Fed fund rate cuts that we got. And he gives a great little, um, little blurb about what he expects the you know markets to look like in 2025 um, through 2026. And so, like I said, there's just a lot of great information in here um, that I think people uh, should be looking at. Um, and so, yeah, that's the Create Book. And the last thing that I wanted to point out to you guys is I... Like I said, do try to I do try to bring you things that I think you might be able to use in your business. Sometimes I may be more successful than others. Um, one of the things, though, that I know that people are always interested in is, you know, the days on market, what the market's doing, and those kind of things. And so, um, since we're you know now into um, about halfway in October, the uh, numbers for. Um, September have been released, and so I thought I would share those with you. Um, the median sales price for Memphis um, is right now is sitting at $215,000. Um, that's about 4% higher than um, the price average was in the previous year. Uh, our median days on the market is now 52 days. So again, guys, um, when you're setting up, setting yourself up to get a listing, um, or if you're even talking to home buyers about, 
you know, their chances of buying. You want to be sure to be honest with them about the days on market. Even if your house is priced right, you're looking at about 52 days right now. Um, and the powers that be are calling Memphis a balanced market. So we have just about as much of demand for people wanting to buy as we do for people who are looking to sell. We're uh, officially in what they are calling a balanced market. Um, when you go down to DeSoto County or Mississippi, it's a little bit different. Memphis is a major statistical area, so I don't have to look at all the other little counties around to figure out the numbers because um, they're all kind of wrapped up in the MAR data. Uh, but with Mississippi, it's a little bit different because it's a non-disclosure state, meaning they don't make available to the public um, all of the same information there that they do uh, here that they do there. And so um, it's broken down a little bit different. The median list price in all of DeSoto County is $323,528. Bridgetown in DeSoto County um, has the highest median list price um, at $439,500, and a half, $439,500. Um, Horn Lake is at $269,900. That's the median list price. Uh, Horn Lake, I mean, not Horn Lake, Olive Branch is at a median list price of $416,000. Uh, South Haven is at a median list price of $304,000. Hernando is at a median list price of 399.9, so $399,900, so right at $400,000. Mineral Wells, which is a nice little corner over there on the other side of um, Olive Branch that most people don't even think about, um, they have a median list price of 415, no, $417,500. Uh, Nesbitt, which a lot of other people are starting to recognize is down there, but it's also a quaint little area just past Olive Branch. Um, it's uh, median uh, list price is $399,400. And then obviously Walls, um, which is west of, you know, your, which is west of uh, actually Horn Lake and, um, in South Haven, it's $319,500. The average home value in all of DeSoto County is $289,499,000. And that's a 0.9% increase from the previous year. And they have a median uh, number of days on the market of 54. So they're about two days longer on the market down there than we are up here in the Memphis market. And then Arkansas is another one that I look at the county um, more so than the individual cities because um, you've got West Memphis and that's what most people think about. Then they think about Marion, but there's other little towns um, over there that are, that are not that far from that that make up the county and so i look at crittenden as it is it, as a market itself and all the little towns within crittenden county their median list price is 244,900 the median sold price is a hundred and ninety two thousand eight hundred and sixteen dollars and they have 64 days on the market. So we're still high in the, in the uh, amount of days on the market compared to what a lot of people have been used to these last couple of years. Um, we are, like I said, working in a balanced market at this point. And you can probably feel that in your business. We don't have, you know, a lot of people clamoring to go view homes and, you know, um, it's just a matter of getting people to, to pick from the homes that are on the market. Um, and so that's where we are with um, with that. You know, you guys really ought to really be preparing your clients with truthful information. You know, not telling them, oh, oh I can sell this house in a flash. Unless you have a buyer or somebody that's already interested 
um, or something like that, you really want to be um, truthful in, in telling people how long it's going to take them to sell their properties. Another thing that you want to do is make sure that you know you are keeping in contact with your with your sellers. Um, I am on a two week uh, stretch now with my sellers, um, just letting them know, hey, you know, we'll revisit this in two weeks. Your price, um, we'll talk about who's looked at it. Um, you know, what type of performance it's gotten on the internet in terms of, of, of people viewing. And I'm able to see that for not just my listings, but it's specifically agents who are um, licensed in the state of Tennessee. Um, if you're, um, if you're, um, if you're one of my agents, I can pull that up. So be able to tell you, you know, um, how many um, impressions your property, your listing got, how many websites it actually was featured on, um, and things of that nature. MAR does give you um, history about what it's done in their MLS, but I can give you the, a little bit more um, information in terms of that. And I actually use that data to help my clients price correct. Um, and so maybe we can talk about that on another episode. How do you get your clients to, you know, correct their price after they're, you know, so adamant that what they want to list for is what, you know, is what they should get and um, talk about that. Um, so, but that's where we are right now um, in terms of days on the market, um, median list price, median sales price for the different areas that we do the most business in. Um, I was, I'm supposed to remind you guys last week that, but I didn't do so that we now have in the Memphis office, um, signs, riders for your yard signs that say, um, we'll co-op. Those are $12, I believe. Um, so you can come, uh, ca call us here at the office. You can come by the Memphis office and pick one up, um, um, if you're in Mississippi and you want to purchase one of those, um, you can purchase it down there with Erica and Tanil and I can have, um, the, the product delivered. I do want to uh, remind you guys also that we have other merchandise at our company store. We, um, put that store together to be able to make it easier for you, um, to be able to buy the things that you need to advertise your business and to do so at a reasonable price. Um, I know people are used to going to who they're going to. New agents probably don't know who to go to. Um, we can help you with that. Um, our signs, our metal signs are the cheapest um, of, any, of anybody that I know. We have metal frames. We also sell those. Those are, they come cheaper than any other um, company out there um, that's local. We purposefully do that um, to provide you with convenience, you know, and a good deal. So make sure that you guys are utilizing that. Um, also, I wanted to point out that we are going to, I am going to participate in um, the show and tell, which is a wonderful event put on by Foundation Title and Bank of England. Um, and basically what they do is they allow you to come and do show and tell for one of your listings, um, tell people all about it. You can invite the community out. You can invite your fellow real estate agents. There's always other real estate agents there. You can talk to them about your properties and hopefully, you know, find someone within the ranks that can make a deal with you. So I will be there promoting uh, four listings that I have. Um, I think it's important for people to, you know, be available to talk about their own listings. And then historically, I have done that. I've taken other people's listings to this show and tell. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just, I just, I have enough listings of my own at this point 
then I really need to be promoting those. And so I'm encouraging you to do the same. If you need the information about how to get your listing up on the show and tell and what the details are, it's a free event. Uh, please let me know. You can send me an email and I will definitely share the information with you. Um, and so, and I encourage you guys to provide me feedback on this podcast. Let me know what you think. Um, it was really a test. Um, so for, uh, you know, something that I thought I would add um, this year to figure out, if, you know, if we could drive up participation and communication amongst the agents. Um, I've gotten some great feedback so far um, from you guys, but I really want to keep it coming because like I said, I am in the planning stages of, of what I'm going to do for the next year and how you guys respond to me in such things um, makes a huge, huge difference. I'm also going to be putting out here within the month or so um, the um, agent survey that I usually have been sending around for the past few years, hoping that people will respond to that survey and let me know um, what things we can do to enhance your experience as an agent here at best. Um, and it's great to also, you know, figure out ways to um, expand with you in mind. So with that being said, I'd like to thank you so, so much for joining me. I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome weekend. And I hope that you are able to sell something. Bye-bye.